So here's a short little clip of the Mills Roulette being operated. I'm going to bet on black and red and green. Red hit, so it paid off. Let's give it another shot. Bet on black, yellow, green, red. Black again, and we hit a winner. One more try. Maybe we can hit a long shot. Just red, so it paid off too. So here's the front of the mechanism for the Mills Roulette. Um, obviously this is the coin head, this is the coin tube which the winners are paid from, this is the, uh, the push pin for when the coin tube gets full to redirect the extra coins down the chute which goes into the cash box, um, and the, the way the machine, the way the mills roulette pays is by a single slicer which is down here. Every time that actuates, two coins are spit out. So, for example, if you hit a 10 coin winner, this will actuate five times. Um, the coin head is designed to show the last several nickels that are, have been played for every color. So the operator could tell if slugs were being used or not. And it, the way it works is kind of counterintuitive. You'll see nickels that are represent the, the various colors you can bet on. If there's a nickel behind the color, that means the color was not bet. If there is not a nickel behind the color, then that was the color that was bet. So, for example, the last time this was played, I can tell that black was bet on and none of the other colors were bet. Also, the last coin played in nickel in black is right there, so you can actually see the last three coins played. Um, actually, you can see the last three coins for every color, but the fact that this one is above everything else also indicates that black was paid. So I'll go ahead and zoom in on this and so you can see how it works when a, a couple bets are played. On the coin head, it, like I said earlier, it shows the last several coins played. This coin head does not auto-fill by itself. If you start the machine, if you get the machine and there are no nickels in it ever, when you play it, it will only be shown the last nickel. This is uh, by design, and Mills made it very easily to do what's called prime the coin head, and you can do this when the mechanism is actually in the machine. When you, if you move the, remove the casting, which is held in by a lock, the front casting, you can get to this area. What you do is you remove this cotter key here, and then this whole thing just pops right off. And then you can manually flip the levers to simulate a coin being put in, and then that will allow you to put a nickel in each slot. So you just manually push a little lever there and then you can uh, fill up the coins and then you're good to go. And if the machine ever gets out of sync when it's being played and it's not showing the correct number of nickels, it's very easy to pop this open and fix it. So again this machine was made before 1910 this particular machine was made on July 13, 1907, and they didn't figure out a way to have it automatically uh, load the coin head, so the operator had to do it manually, but they made it very easy to do. So here's a close-up of the coin head, 
And I'll make uh, two bets. I'll bet on uh, black and green. So I put a nickel behind black and a nickel in the green. So when I cycle it, you'll see the coins that are kicked out in black and green, but all these other colors will remain. And the last coin played for black and green will be at the very top. So sure enough, there's not a coin behind black, there's not a coin behind green, and the nickels that were put in are right on top. So I'll go ahead and finish the cycle of the machine. And uh, next I'll zoom in on the uh, coin payout so you can see, see the slicer actually operate for when a winner's hit. So this time I will bet on, uh, let's pick uh, yellow, and uh, I'll force yellow to be hit. Stop the wheel on yellow and hit the ball detection lever. And you can see that yellow pays out 20 cents, which it activated twice to kick out two nickels each time. So here's a shot from the left side of the uh, mechanism as you're looking at it. You'll see a couple timing cams. Um, this large one here is what resets the payout lever bar which has its own timing wheel and timing clock. This cam here will stop the, uh, the timing once it has uh, rotated, I would guess about 220 degrees, a little, little bit more than halfway, and the rest of the cycle will not occur until the ball detection uh, lever is, catches the ball which will then cause this little bar to raise up and allow the rest of the machine to cycle through the payout detection phase, which will then allow the horizontal payout levers to lower down, and if it's on a color that was selected, will cause the timing uh, mechanism to cycle. So I'll go ahead and cycle it a couple times um, at this angle, and then I'll zoom in. So the cam is rotated about 220 degrees, now it's waiting for the ball to hit the detection uh, mechanism. When that happens, this lever will raise up, allowing the cycle to complete. And it did, and I actually hit black, which is what I bet on, so it actually paid, paid out two coins. So I'll zoom in so you can get a little closer view of it. And we'll do it again. Okay, this time it won't pay. I'll pick a color that we didn't bet on. And that's it. So you may have noticed the very interesting governor right there, which controls you know, how fast the cam will ro rotate. Let me actually zoom in on that guy. And we'll play another coin. And... Here's the back of the Mills Roulette, and this is where you can really see the, the guts of the mechanism and understand how it really works. It's actually very simple. There is one timing cam that runs the entire width of the machine. That cam is powered by a coil spring very similar to what's in music boxes. That spring is there. And the, so the, the, the timing arm runs in full, the full width and controls six functions of the machine. It controls the uh, the coin overflow pushback lever, which sends overflow coins into the cash box. It controls the coin head to cycle the coin head as the machine is being played. It cycles the actual wheel to spin the wheel. It cycles the, uh, or controls the 
the stop lever for the uh, the payout timing clock, which is this guy right here. It controls the reset arm for the timing mechanism, and that part's over there. And finally, it controls the uh, the hardware for catching the ball and then also releasing it and that cam is clear on the far right. So I'll go ahead and cycle it and show you the, the different cams as they're operating. So you probably saw the cam has spun about 220 degrees which is a little over half a circle. It is now waiting for the ball to land in the check detection lever. The wheel is directly connected to this disc here which has holes in it which is very similar to how a traditional three reeler works. Instead of having three payout discs it only has one though because there's only one wheel. On the bottom of this is another large gear which has tabs. When the ball gets caught in the lever this it will allow the individual horizontal payout detection levers to drop into a hole. If a color was selected that lines up with a hole, this the horizontal lever will continue the drop, cause this lever to raise up, releasing the timing fan, and then this large gear will cycle, and as it cycles, the two coin payout mechanism that is below the coin tube will cycle and there are little tabs on this that will hit the corresponding pin that dictates how many times this will run so whether it pays out two coins or fifty coins. Um, I'll go ahead and I think I bet on black so I'll hit black and I'll flip the coin the ball uh, detection and it will and it paid out two coins as you can see there. so it cycled slightly if it had hit a non-winner which I'll cycle next so I'll stop the wheel on yellow As you can see, this lever never went up, so it never allowed the clock to the timing clock to spin, so nothing ever got paid out. So everything is controlled from this one cam except for the actual payout. That is controlled by this clock. And when I was first looking at this machine, I saw this bracket over here, and I could not figure out what in the world that bracket was for because it wasn't connected to anything. So I thought, hmm, wonder if something's missing off the mechanism. Well, turns out that like many of the machines that were built in the 1900s, they had built-in cheaters. As the payout bar is paying off on the very large payout, which is double zero, it's supposed to pay out 50 coins, which is two dollars and fifty cents. However, there's an adjustment on this bracket. If you move it all the way to the left, it will cause the machine to pay out ten cents short. The only way I found this out was when I was testing all the payouts, it was always paying out ten cents short on the double zero, and I could not figure out why. And once I started investigating it, I noticed it was hitting this bracket when I slid the bracket back a few millimeters it allowed the machine to pay off correctly if this bracket is removed entirely it will still pay off correctly for double zero because it will hit the tab on this gear so that is there only to increase the payout or the uh, return for the house by 10 cents on the large payouts um, I'll go ahead and cycle it again now and we'll hit a large payout and you can see the uh, timing mechanism for the payout in action. Okay, so I bet on double zero, which is the, the long shot. Pays out five dollars. Uh, 
I will line up double zero. And as you can see, the gear that's connected to the springs, which uh, runs the clock and everything, is this guy right here. And it came back to rest against that lever, which is, or that bracket, which is the bracket that's used to cheat the customer by 10 cents. If that bracket were moved over further to the left by a quarter inch or so, it'd pay out 10 cents short. Um, the springs that drive the payout clock and all that, there are two uh, pretty beefy springs down at the bottom and on the they connect to an armature which has several holes in it so you can adjust the tension. I've got it adjusted so it is just strong enough to pay out. So it pays out kind of slow but it is strong enough to pay out the entire amount. Um, it was originally set to be pay out much faster, but that's just going to add more pressure on the parts. And given that this thing is 107 years old, um, I decided to reduce the, the tension of the springs by moving the uh, springs further towards the center of the uh, of the lever. And I'll take a take a video from the bottom so you can see what I'm talking about. So here's a shot from shooting up from below the machine. Here are the two large springs that control the payout timing. They connect to a bar over there which has a bunch of holes drilled in it and if you move the springs further to the left that's further out on the bar and that will essentially increase the tension which will cause it to run faster. I'll go ahead and cycle it again and we'll hit another large payout so you can see that. Okay, here's a close-up of the actual payout mechanism and what I'll do is I'll uh, have another large payout hit and you'll be able to uh, see the slicer slice the coins out. Up the wheel on double zero. So it throws them out pretty good, and if you look at the at the cabinet, which I'll have some pictures of, you can see there's a very large funnel that's designed to to catch those nickels and send them down into the uh, payout cup. Here's a uh, little bit of a view from the right hand side of the mechanism as you're looking at it from the front, left hand side from the rear, so you can see the handle which is you know connected to that timing cam there's a uh, the horizontal fingers which drop down when you hit a winner um, so it takes seven coins there's seven horizontal fingers and I don't know if you can see it or not let me move the camera but the finger on the right here of these four is actually dropped down because we hit a winner. That one corresponds is, corresponds to the double zero. When that went down, that raised this lever up, which then released the timing clock. Another kind of interesting thing to point out is how the wheel actually gets energy to be spun around. That's done through a ratchet, and 
Let me zoom in on it. That's right there. And the way it works is there's four small little ball bearings inside this ratchet. And so basically it allows the wheel to spin in one direction. And that's clockwise. So during the windup, the cam will cause the ratchet to move about probably, I don't know, 45 degrees counterclockwise, which basically winds it. And then it will force it to move the other 45 degrees clockwise, which engages the wheel to start spinning. One thing you do not want to do is put any oil in there because the, those ball bearings need to move extremely free and oil will cause those small ball bearings to kind of stick which will then cause the ratchet to not do its job properly. So I'll go ahead and cycle the machine. And as you should have seen, the uh, wheel, the ratchet turned a little bit counterclockwise and then clockwise. And it'll go back to the at rest position once it completes the rest of the cycle. Again, it is all controlled by that main timing cam. So if I move the wheel counterclockwise, whoops, I hit a, wheel, hit a winner. Um, well, if I wouldn't have hit a winner, you would have seen it actually force that uh, in the counterclockwise positions because it's engaging the ratchet. We'll go ahead and cycle it one more time so you can see it again. So I stop the wheel manually, so if I turn a clock counterclockwise, you can see how it's engaging that ratchet, but when it spins clockwise, it just spins free. And there's a spring right there, which provides the energy to spin the wheel, to move that, that gear, that ratchet. So here's another angle showing the right hand side of the mechanism and you can see the again the horizontal fingers for four of the payouts and then there's a there's a big ratchet that's connected to the handle and we'll go ahead and cycle it And we actually hit a winner. I'll zoom in and uh, show you, try to get some real close-ups of the, of the mechanism. And you can see that all of the original plating is still there, which is obviously very desirable and one would be absolutely crazy to pull this mechanism apart and put it in a bead blaster or something like that you would uh, really hurt the value and the desirability of this machine if you did that finding mechanisms that have this much original plating which is almost all of it on this machine is uh, very desirable the tray for the wheel you know was plated and some of that plating is coming off which is understandable 
from the ball flying around and rolling on it and hitting it. And of course it could be replated, but in my opinion, you would be crazy to do that. And the, uh, these arms here all have the original plating on them, which is really, really nice. And what's kind of cool is you can actually see into the mechanism when you're looking down on the... So here's the wheel showing the Mills Roulette. And the way the machine works is it's got a ball catcher. And when the ball eventually ends up in a pocket, it will, the ball catcher will catch the ball. It'll stop the wheel exactly where the ball is. Therefore, the payout disc, which has all the holes in it, is lined up properly. And then it can uh, pay out if the coin head uh, had a coin bet on the appropriate color, which would allow the horizontal fingers to drop. And um, so when the machine is cycled, this catcher will first move to the right to release the ball. It will then immediately move to the left into the catch position. And then once the ball is in the pocket, it will catch the ball and the machine can then pay appropriately if uh, the user bet on the right color. So we bet, on, we bet on yellow, red was hit so it didn't pay out. Let's do it again. This time we'll bet on red and black. And we hit red and it paid out. So that's uh, that's how the roulette machine works for the mills. And what's really cool about, uh, about these gaps here is you can actually see the mechanism from the machine and see the, the, the nice plating and all that. 